faculty or the student, they usually join. Uh, in postgraduates, they do what is called as a grand ward round, where all patients in the surgical ward or medical ward are included. And uh, uh, faculty, three or four faculty, uh, usually concerned heads of the unit, they join. And then this is usually for postgraduates. And then uh, same thing, the patients are being presented by postgraduates. And there's a detailed discussion about diagnosis, treatment protocol, and uh, what they call as outcomes. So this is also another form of clinic. Then uh, undergraduates usually teach operation procedures in say, theaters where uh, we are demonstrating surgery and then all those uh, surgical procedures which undergraduates are supposed to know, uh, they are displayed either on the TV or on the display boards in the overside rooms. And then there's interactive session where a consultant teaches uh, while he's operating or while his assistant is operating to the students. Same thing can happen with uh, ICU where uh, we have ICU bedside clinics and apparently, as you bet, said, uh, the students are limited because we want to reduce the number of uh, say, entries in infection. So we usually give uh, or two or three students and the bedside clinics are there. And there are some uh, clinics with the trigger points, like uh, we teach uh, uh, half of time X-rays, CT scan, and MRI clinically, and then where uh, one of the students will pick up the X-ray and then he will do all that. Whereas this is one of the say, routinely thing for radiology appointment posting. And we teach instruments and surgical procedures as well as uh, surgery for pathology specimens. So beware, it is a trigger point. And when uh, the specimen or the instrument is given, and then it's an interactive session with the faculty. So it's a small group discussion, a large group discussion, like a lecture hall, where 200, 250 students are there. Whereas in a, this is a clinic, uh, the maximum students are 30. And uh, say a National Medical Commission also wants only 30 students, uh, maximum. And then in each ward, there are clinic rooms available. And these are, they are well equipped. Now I work with uh, symbiosis. Uh, in, even in a clinic uh, in a side room, it is equipped with, uh, say, overhead projector, slide projector, and uh, even uh, say discussion media is available. And it is interactive because one student is presenting and then rest of the students can ask questions and then the questions are asked and then topic flourishes through the discussion. Usually this is uh, teacher centered, but then this, I think this is one of the, uh, the some attempts of uh, student centeredness is there. And then student uh, select cases from the ward and uh, usually the registrar or chief resident will tell you that take that case and depending on what are the topics to be covered in that uh, clinical posting? Uh, those topics are presented. Usually, these clinical postings are usually four, and each one for two months. And uh, the first clinical posting comes first, first with surgery and medicine combined. And then second, third, and fourth, uh, they come afterwards, where uh, um, we have some curriculum and syllabus of each posting, and therefore we, we teach accordingly. So, uh, so the, we might have a classical bedside clinic that we are going to discuss. At the same time, uh, the student-centered, uh, what we call as a problem-based learning can be used. I have work on problem-based learning in India because I was one of the pioneer faculty after I did my fellowship at FAMER, Foundation of Advancement of International Medical Education from Philadelphia. And problem-based learning was my curriculum research project. And therefore, I did that uh, PBL, and subsequently I modified that PBL to take the real cases, and then we do we did a tremendous job. And I think uh, even now, the National Medical Commission has also asked for case-based learning and problem-based learning to be included. Obviously, uh, we require to have a new type of new foundation, and uh, all these evaluations usually of instruments, cases, X-rays or uh, pathology specimens, this could be done with OSCE, where uh, it's a structured examination. And I think uh, we take uh, some clinics on how to appear for OSCE. So bedside clinic uh, usually start when the, post, when the students come, usually in the first term, we teach them about history taking. 
Now, history taking is asking the patient what are the chief complaints and what are the, how does it progress? And then we have details of origin, duration, progress. And then we ask them details about that. And then uh, we go into clinical diagnosis. And in addition, we demonstrate clinical skills and we begin training. We come to conclusion about what are the investigations being done, we discuss management protocols and surgical outcomes. So these are the aims and objectives of a bedside clinic. It starts from history taking to a surgical procedure and post-operative outcome. So while we discuss about uh, say clinical diagnosis, in allopathy or whatever branch we follow, the clinical diagnosis has a very definite philosophy. It's a philosophy is of exclusion. When the patient comes to you and he narrates the story, before the patient narrates the story, anything can be there under the sun. And then he describes you complaints, then the, it goes narrows, and then he describes how it started and how it progressed, and it still narrows. And then we go on asking positive questions, negative questions, and details of ODP. And then we go on excluding the disease. And at the end of history, if you are taking a perfect history, you should be able to come to diagnosis two or three, should be, uh, say, what you called as food uh, by investigation. So, uh, history taking, this is a classical thing. The patient describes chief complaints, and then uh, the chief complaints are to be in chronological order. And then uh, we ask them about these complaints, how do they appear? It's called ODP. And then uh, we, we have details of ODP available. Now, while the patient describes his chief complaints and his ODP, we create an image of a disease in your mind. And then you want to compare that image of the disease, either which has been created in your mind to see earlier patients or seeing, uh, say something from what you call as uh, reading the textbooks. So what happens is, uh, this is what is called as creating an image of a disease, what the patient describes. And then you are comparing that image in your mind about the earlier patient, earlier description in the book. Then the image doesn't match. And therefore, in order to match that image further, we ask them some, what we call as a positive questions. And this is what's called as a positive history. And our aim is to find out how that can go hand in hand and image gets what is called as uh, perfect. Then there might be some important thing about the negative history where we are doing uh, so what are things not available and uh, say past history. But at the end of history taking, we, our aim is to come to do our three diagnosis. So this is the whole philosophy of history taking. So, uh, so this is what is called, uh, what we call as an algorithmic approach of history. I'll describe some example. So let us say a patient comes with the jaundice. He has a pruritus, high color urine, and the stool is white. So what he describes first is he has a jaundice or presence of a yellow color sclera. So we are asking questions. First question is in history of loss of appetite or fever. If it is yes, then it is infective appetite. So these three things would convert and send it to an, so what you call as a medical jaundice. Then we ask about blood transfusion, unsafe injections, or it could be something like hepatitis B. So up to this, it is medical jaundice. Then the jaundice could be hemolytic, where it is usually from childhood, familial, anemia, and then history of anemia, then it becomes hemolytic. These are the different types of patients. These two patients, two types are there. Then now we are asking for the positive history or um, the patient might complain. So in case the patient doesn't complain, then we put in positive history. So what we ask is either the itching, riotous, or whether the patient has passed the white colors too. So these are the three symptoms which determine whether it is a medical jaundice or a surgical jaundice. In, the, in case these are present, then it becomes a surgical jaundice. And then actually the one, the moment these are there, what is important is in clinical examination, the only one thing, finding out whether the liver is enlarged 
But the best thing which can which can describe and differentiate is whether the gallbladder is palpable. If the gallbladder is palpable, then it could be carcinoma head of the pancreas or periampullary carcinoma. If it is not, then according to Kruiser's law, it could be either chronic cholecystitis or chronic cholecystitis. So if you see at the end of history of a jaundice patient, everything is clear. And in a clinical examination, we are discussing about three or four things. And then, then we just palpate for the gallbladder or palpate for liver. If the liver is palpable and tender, it is infected hepatitis. If it is not, then it is surgical. And then the applying Carvizer's law, we can discuss about whether it's a called as jaundice because of strictures or the stones or because of carcinoma of pancreas. So I can, now this is giving you an exact detail about how it is done. And then uh, we examine, find out what is sclera, what is skin and mucous membrane, is then icterus, and then obviously both the patients can go into hepatic failure. So we can ask about hepatic, signs of hepatic failure. And then palpation, we'll find out liver present or free fluid, or then is a mass and the gallbladder is pulpy. So uh, what, well, the moment it is this, the investigation of importance is direct bilirubin. If the direct or conjugated bilirubin is increased, then it is surgical jaundice. In addition, we find out how is alkaline phosphatase. So these two tests will tell you about a surgical jaundice. So I think starting from a history to the investigation, in, uh, this is an algorithmic approach to find out how we are doing. So uh, then, uh, then I'm this same thing, I just want to find out how it could be centered by uh, a problem-based learning. Now, the problem-based learning depends on, on a one basic thing called uh, medical education is an adult learning. And therefore, we need to understand because medical students are adult. And therefore, if you try to teach them, like a kids in the school, they don't learn. So they learn if you want to use it. They learn only when it is relevant. They, they solve problems to learn concepts. Then we can't ask them to run. They run, learn as their own space. Then they set up their own, uh, say, learning objectives and they preserve the self esteem and then have different ideas from what is important to learn. This is adult education. And depending on this, we have a problem based learning, a learning method based on principles using problems as a starting point for the acquisition and integration of new knowledge. So in a case-based learning where cases are taken, we have tutors, and then he decides about what the students should know by, does, by giving what the learning objectives. And then we have a tutorial group where uh, five to say 10 students are taken. They relate among themselves a chair, a scribe, a the person who writes, presenter, timekeeper, and group member. And then we require a tutor who is just going to help them. Uh, by finding out what, whether they are working with learning objectives. He should be doing about process of CBL. And then this is commitment to the student-centered learning. And then we will train chief residents as tutors. And therefore, the process is, uh, uh, the problem is read by the tutor. Uh, it goes into what is called as a progressive disclosure, where there is a brainstorm, hypothesize, and then ask each other, and then finding out what are the learning issues. And then say they, they find out what they do not know. And they go back and learn about finding out details of the learning issues after researching. And then they come back after two days, and then they report. And then we go to the next CBA. So that is an irritative process. And uh, afterwards, once they present, sometimes they might talk bookish before they take uh, consult faculty and take their own opinion. So the, after the first thing that when they are finding out what they do not know, that is learning issue. And therefore, this is basic of uh, problem-based learning or case-based learning, is that children determine their own level of ignorance and find out what should be done. And then they, have, they might have their own meetings and then and they can go to the resources, they can come to the tutor, and this is how it goes up. So the important part of PBL is learning between the sessions. So in a traditional learning, 
the thing is student center when say teacher center whereas everybody is asking to the teacher whereas in a problem a cpr clinic is interactive the students are asking about each other so uh, the, i think this is what is called as a cbl and uh, had been advocating stage based learning for for say clinical cases and i think this could be followed and done into all these uh, say undergraduate teams now what is most important is a clinical skill teaching so there what is important is to find out how will you teach the skills because history taking will come to the two or three diagnosis clinical examination will come down to say further diagnosis so so let us say uh, we want to find out how it could be done by algorithmic approach now i had been teaching in undergraduates for 30 more 40 years and i'd been advising these algorithmic approach and i asked the students to prepare powerpoint based on these observation now this is one of the powerpoint created by one of my student nikita choudhury i don't know where she is and i think this around 10 to 15 or maybe 20 year old story she might be one of the consultant i hope uh, we can approach to this doc flexus webinar and then i have to thank her because she did a nice thing so let us say we want to find out uh, lump so how can you have algorithmic approach so the three things morphology of lump where it is situated what is it contain these are three algorithms we are going to solve so where it is situated where all uh, size shape surface surrounding area and margin will come and then we want to find out where it is situated superficial extent we already know but then which exact tissue pain it is situated and then third thing is whether the swelling of the lung is related to cilomic cavity like the abdomen thorax cranium where it is there because of cup impulses so tissue plane uh, this algorithmic approach first pinch up if you are able to pinch the skin it is the subcutaneous if they are not it is skin and then usually lymph nodes are found into the areas where there are multiple things are there and then it could be below the muscle above the muscle of the muscle and then if you say tot the muscle the it becomes prominent it is above no change in the muscle and it disappears below the muscle and obviously if it is bony it's hard any more boy so now i i don't want to go in detail because all undergraduate and then once it subcutaneous tissue uh, if it is nerve then it can be moved on one direction if it is arterial then it will be pulsatile if it is venous then it collapses then it is raised and then i think with this we find out where it is situated so third thing which open what is it contain and the content you find out by consistency which bases on newton's third law of motion what you do is we just come as a press and find out how much pressure is required and how much is resilience if after the pressure it gives way then it is soft system if it doesn't there is hard if there is no change it is what we call as firm and what is soft system then we want to find out whether there is a fluid inside by doing a fluctuation test and if, then we want to find out that fluid is clear by doing the transformation so i think these are the various states that So this algorithmic approach for the swelling. So same thing we can do for scrotal. First, we want to find out which is scrotal, inguinal scrotal, by whether are you going to go above the swelling, and then by consistency. If you are going to go above the swelling, it's scrotal. If not, then it is inguinal swelling. And then um, the consistency, it is hard, firm, and soft. And therefore, if it's hard, it is anoma. If it's firm, it could be acute. Uh, infection or if it is soft cystic then it is cystic and then uh, form swelling epidermal morcaritis you have to differentiate between torsion testes and then soft cystic you do uh, what is called as transsublimation and then negative it is hematocele pyocele callocele heterocele or if it is positive it is vaginal heterocele you do want to find out attraction test be able to pull it down it is heterocele uh, then if it is And if you can't put it down, then it is good that I mean sister is coming to see. So then, transmission indicative, hematocele, pyocele, callocele. 
So I think this is the one where we are applying an algorithmic approach. Uh, now for teachers who are attending this session, I want all of us to try to create same algorithm approach for all the surgical diseases, all the diseases. Therefore, we can develop into all these things. Now with this, uh, I just want to find out while you are teaching them clinical skills, uh, we need to follow or identify what is the uh, uh, either neuron approach. And because neural neurons are something which help you for clinical skill training. So neural neurons are specialized cells. Now, uh, it has been discovered by Rizalti in, in the Mac monkey, where they have discovered a curious cluster of these cells. Now, monkey fired same set of neurons when the monkey grabbed the peanut or watched somebody else do grabbing the peanut. So, even if you watch doing something and when you are doing yourself, same set of neurons are fired. So, and that means that whole process depends upon uh, this procedure and if we learn by imitation. So, and so Piaget suggested that the babies learn from imitation. So, the mirror neurons, uh, they observe the behavior, emotions, empathy, copy behavior. And I think uh, this is something which uh, I just want you to understand that the whole thing of a clinical skill where you are copying is coming through the mirror neurons. And therefore, copying behavior and same thing, we are imitating and therefore that also goes down. So uh, mirror neurons and clinical examination skills, uh, if we are directly Now, let us say we are doing a palpation test. So, what is important is if you directly see and then find out what is happening, is a different story. But then, in a, suppose you are want to do uh, mirror neurons, what you have to do is all these clinical skills you, you follow by constant observation. Because all these clinical skills we do by imitation. And when the student watch, you need to watch carefully for the small details. When do they perform the examination, they recollect scenes in their mind and they copy the action to the mirror neurons. And in order to perfect and mirror neurons to be active, they should close their eyes and play the scene behind and then performance will be improved. And therefore, once you do that, then all these uh, mirror neurons will be get activated and the clinical skills will be imitated and you will get better understood. I think, uh, let us say, you are eliciting uh, tenderness in a night disc. What you have to do, you have to observe and find out how it is doing. All these palpation tests can be done in all these mirror neurons. So, mirror neurons, they can give you uh, even tactile sensation. Well, you are, if you are palpating, find out how is liver, spleen, uh, what are the details of lung, and then maybe uh, you can have. Uh, the tactile sensation to be combined with mirror neurons and teacher will do the test to describe and then while he is finding out a lump just between touching finger and going away and the deep breathing so this same thing could be done and i think uh, once you understand this whole principle that you are imitating uh, the say whole thing and therefore uh, the edge of the liver consistency of lump that whole thing could be done now uh, let us say let us say we, have, we want to do a percussion. So in a percussion, in addition to the tactile thing, we have auditory signals. So uh, I'm watching the teacher is doing the percussion. And, the same and now I'm going to ask my patient to move, to move laterally. So if there is any fluid present over here, fluid is going to shift at the down part. And after that, I will be checking for the shifting of dullness if there is any fluid present over there. So can you please turn? So, so in a percussion test, we have what is called as audio motor integration. So percussion test elicits the sound and it is percepted by auditory brain. And I think this same sound of percussion is played in mind compared to why the test is being repeated. The mirror neurons play a role in understanding music. The same philosophy will go understanding percussion. All percussions like resonant node, dull node, fluid free, 
everything could be recorded. And through the audio motor integration, a student will learn about uh, these tests. I think in order to understand the whole basic thing, we are finding out how we are imitating. And therefore, this imitation will only tell you how perfect you can follow clinical tests. So surgical skills, clinical skills, all these come through all these new animals. So thank you very much for uh, patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Jamkar, for such an insightful session. We have few questions for you. My first question to you is, what is the current status of bedside teaching practice? So current status, uh, we still teach undergraduate, postgraduates by bedside practice. As I told you, uh, I'm talking about surgery because of professor of surgery. So eight months of posting, of clinical posting and surgery, two months each in the four terms. And then uh, we teach them the first clinical posting, the bedside clinics is about history taking and basic clinical skills. And then they come again and uh, they then, uh, uh, depending on the curriculum, the first, first clinical posting will have history taking. In addition, we teach them about scrotal swelling, inval hernia, heterosine, ricosine, something like that. When they come for the second posting, then we talk about uh, lumps in abdomen, thyroid, and other things. Third thing, uh, then we go into central nervous system, uh, say limbs and all that. So whole curriculum is distributed in four terms. And then there is usually an overlap uh, because uh, afterwards we don't become that much strict. So it, it depends on uh, patients. Suppose we have a patient of carcinoma breast available, so we might teach them in second post. Then, uh, say we suppose we want to have a head and neck cancer, we might do it in third post. So, depending upon availability of the cases in the world, we teach them accordingly. But at present, we completely follow bedside clinics, and uh, all, uh, say, clinical training is through bedside clinics. And then, in addition, uh, twice a week, we go to theater where they watch surgery. They watch, uh, they call it surgical procedures required for undergraduates. Then we have three types, assist, watch, and perform. So sometimes if they are intelligent enough, we even let them perform. And then they watch, uh, say, major surgeries, and then assume, sometimes they assist. So in addition, this whole thing is seen in side rooms of operation theaters, because we already have Camera is fixed, the uh, light, and then we can see around. Other thing is usually some older hospital, older colleges they have uh, galleries for the students where they can watch the two galleries. And third thing is they can directly come inside. Then we restrict entry to maximum five to ten students inside. And I think this is how we do operation theater and we call surgical demonstration of operation. In addition, we teach them X-rays, instruments. And surgical pathology. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. My second question to you is what alternatives are being employed to simulate bedside teaching during the COVID 19 pandemic? During COVID pandemic, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a really serious lapse and limitation for teaching. And, but then that gave uh, impetus to find out how we can do an online teaching. And therefore, all the and details uh, were explored. Now we required a lot many manpower. So as a net result, uh, the third year students or maybe fourth year students were directly taken for clinical help as an intern or maybe residents because we required a lot many doctors. But then those uh, who are not, then we are following uh, clinical teaching through online program. So same cases that we discussed uh, one of the student can present, taking one case, and then uh, online, all the students sitting at home will listen to the history taking, then he will demonstrate clinical skills, and then discussion with the tutor who will be available on another screen will be discussed, he will ask questions. And I think uh, we devise a whole mechanism of online teaching. And obviously, uh, we the only problem was the clinical skill trainings. So we demonstrated the clinical skills through videos. There, they were supposed to repeat that, or the we give the link about YouTube, 
and subsequently uh, there was obviously it was not as perfect as doing a clinical skill training directly but i think uh, we tried to um, do um, and replace by online training. thank you thank you for that elaborate answer this brings us to the end of this session thank you all and stay tuned for our next session on neonatal seizures by dr rajendra prasad on september 13 at 6 pm until then happy doctor